uh, the difference between uh, United States in crisis, because now we don't talk about crisis in the United States, curiously enough. You actually see you know, job creation. Uh, for us, uh, large, I think our unemployment now is like 7.1 percent. It's a lot. Uh, I know I can't, I don't have a very sympathetic audience here given what Sp Spain's unemployment rate is, but for, an Ameri for the size of the American economy and the diversity that exists in that economy, that's a lot. Um, we now see houses being built and sold again. We see banks letting money go. But for us, that took maybe a year, year and a half. Spain began, what, early 2008, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013. And have we reached bottom? <laughs> I hope so. You know, we don't know. We hope so. And we hope that this will help us turn the corner. Keep doing It's also a country that has a lot of people. There's 310 million Americans. And we are very consumeristic. It's one of the qualities that <laughs> marks us. Maybe, I don't know. I always have this, are our Spaniards consumeristic? Americans are consumeristic. Um, when you, if you travel around the United States and you go down the street and you see someone has a new window, you want to see how many, else, how many people else have the exact same window. If you ever notice in the United States, we don't build what you, what they tend to in Spain at least, uh, if I have a chalet, I want you to see my house. I'm not going to build these hedges so that you can't see me. I want you to see what I've got, right? In America, you have these broad landscapes there so you can see this palatial house because we want to show that off. It's, it's um, uh, conspicuous consumption, they call it. It may not be one of our best uh, qualities, but if you're trying to sell something there, it certainly would be. We also have one of the best university systems in the world. Um, if you look at, depending upon when you look at rankings, and we were talking about rankings a little bit earlier, uh, if you look at Time, uh, Time Magazine's ranking, and again, I'm not necessarily sure I agree with all the criteria, but of the 50 best universities in the world, 30 of them are in the United States. 30. Uh, it's a totally different concept, higher education, in the United States than it is here in Spain. It's very interesting. I'm now in the process. My daughter, she's, she'll be 16, and I would like her to go to the United States, to university in the United States. And it's a, it's a very interesting process compared to the 30, 40 years ago when I went to when I went to university. It's very, very different, very competitive. Um, building curriculum. How do you build a curriculum when you're 15? No? How do you do it? Well, there is a way, because the Americans have come up with it, let me tell you. Uh, it is also a country that has a lot of funding. There's a lot of state and federal aid for business initiatives, for studying, for creating new companies that is taken very serious and used by our entrepreneurial community. <laughs> we have a really well-prepared workforce. A lot of things, if you want to think about Americans, what are some adjectives? If, you, if, you think of, if you're a manager in the United States and you have 20 Americans reporting to you, what are some adjectives that you would think of now as how you would imagine your workers? Bail them out. What are they? They all sit around on Facebook? What are they? Maybe they are. <laughs> Not a big presence of unions. We don't like unions that much. Um, uh, there are some sectors of our, our economy that are unionized, but usually it's if I, want, if I want something, it's my responsibility to get what I want. I don't want someone negotiating on my behalf. What else? There isn't that sense of collectivity, no? Americans are extremely individualistic. Anything else? They're innovative. They're usually quite creative. Um, they are very, as we said before, because of the education, they're very well prepared, entrepreneurial, um, and they're productive. They're productive. When I, I teach a class on, um, on U.S.-Spain relations uh, in Sevilla, and one of the things I show are productivity rates of Spain versus productivity rates of the United States. So you would think that, you know, the American slave you know, change with computer, always on the Blackberry or the iPhone or whatever, working 24-7, and it's not true. Americans work less hours than the Spanish per year. Spaniards work a lot of hours, a lot of hours. But what's the difference? Their pro productivity is 20% less than the United States. So you work a lot, but you're not doing anything. Whereas an American works less and does a lot more. So very productive workforce, which is very interesting. Also, uh, in terms of education, 41% of Americans between the ages of 25 and 65 have a university degree. 
That may be changing now because of the cost of American universities and changes in our economy, but you have a very well qualified, qualified workforce. The comparable statistic in the European Union is 30%. I don't know specifically what it is for Spain. I would imagine it's probably less than 30%. Innovation. Innovation is a part of the DNA of Americans. I use the example, do you remember taking Plastica when you were in school? Raise your hand. Who remembers taking Plastica? Okay. And what was Plastica? Would someone like to describe to me your, your Plastica class? First of all, wasn't it a kit that mom and dad had to buy? True? Yes. That everybody had to draw the same green color on that part of the kite or that little bird feeder, or what other, I'm sure to say stupid things, but no, they're really stupid. But what struck me as so culturally different is that in the United States, we have arts and crafts. We call it arts and crafts. But there's no kid. So the teacher would give you paper, there's all the materials, kids, go for it, that's all, make a kite. And I remember going to my daughter's um, first grade class, and the teacher had all the kites, they were all exactly the same. The exact same color, in the exact same quadrante, some like super dark, others super light, because that was at least one way to express your personality, you know? Uh, and then subsequent years, I was like, geez Louise, this is 40 freaking euros for this stupid plastic thing, and all they do is produce the same thing. I said, can't they at least do a bird's thing that I can paint it black if I want, or white, or something? It's something that was so interesting to me. Why? Why do you think? Why do you think for an American that would be un poquito chocante? Because it's so programmed, no? In America, it's like, okay, now, the, the project for today is we're going to make a birdhouse. So everybody goes home, and you come in on Monday with a birdhouse. So you have birdhouses that are like, you know, you know, that some major architect design. You have the birdhouse that like practically falls apart. You have everything there because it depends on how I want to create that birdhouse. Some will be painted, some will be crappy, some will be really great, some will be parent did it for them, etc. But it's because of, the, of that thing that I need to create it. I don't need someone to give me a kit to do something. Very interesting concept. I'm not criticizing it if anyone's parents a plastic a teacher, but it just strikes me as like, get the kids out there to do something a little bit different. It's also a country where we have a high respect for intellectual property. So when you see, for example, my daughter, she's like, I don't understand why I can't download music. And I was like, well, you can download music, but you pay 99 cents, or you pay a dollar 99, whatever. Well, all my friends, nobody, you know, pays for this music, and my music is so lengthy, quality, yada, 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 yada. I said, yeah, but if everybody, this poor person made this song, you know, put a lot of energy into it, and should get some beneficio out of it, no? So if you let the poor guy earn 99 cents, what's the big deal? It's not going to cost you, well, it costs you 99 cents, but you get to listen to it as many times as you so desire. Something that really is a part of it. You can't buy a fake DVD. Like, why? Oh, no, 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 no. You just can't do that. It's part of a cultural aspect for respect for something that you invented and that you do. I need to pay you for that. Your intellectual property. We also have, as you well know, a stable and pretty transparent political system. Um, it's pretty easy to know where the power lies. It's a federal system. It's extremely decentralized, which can be a little bit confusing depending on what state you live in. But it's one which uh, the rules of the game are very apparent. Very apparent. Um, it's, a, it's a country that also is looking towards increasing more opportunities for free trade, hence the last statements by President Obama. And it's a competitive market. Um, one of the things I always say to my students when they come, is like, you need to go to a supermarket and walk down the aisles, because you can see the differences and cultural differences as well. So has anyone been in an American supermarket? Raise your hand. Yeah? So what was, what, what was the most thing? I get cultural shock when I go back to an American supermarket. What was something that really, like, they own mucho la atención? What was something that really shocked you when you went in? The things are bigger. For example, the milk. Uh, they, sell, they sell it in bottles of two bottles. Uh -huh. Here is one liter. Of exactly. Uh, exactly. So just the size. You don't get a cereal box like you get here. You get like super duper 25 people per bowl in the morning with cereal, no? Not only do you get the huge sizes, but the variety. So for example, um, you go down the cereal aisle, and there's not just, like we have here, three or four boxes. And like certain stores only carry certain things, which just drives me crazy. I just don't understand. I can't everybody just carry the same marca. No, I have to only have mass carries that. Oh yeah, I forgot that you know, Lidl, no sé qué. All right, fine. But when you go to the United States, it's like aisles of cereal. 
right? I'm using cereal just because kids like cereal. You know? And when, I, when we would go to the United States during the summer, my daughter would be like, she, you would have thought that God had appeared to her in a dream. So I'm like, but mommy, look at all this cereal. I was like, okay, fine. This is the deal. I'm going to go finish shopping. I'm going to come back for you in 10 minutes. You are allowed two boxes. Because I knew it was going to take her 25 minutes just to figure out what box. How about this one? No Captain Crunch. No, how about the Fruit Loops? No, how about this? Okay? Yet, conversely, conversely, if you go down the aisle where you have olive oil, which of course, for those of us that are good, Andalufes, y Cordobeses, we know that olive oil is very important, right? How much olive oil do you see in the United States? Two or three bottles. Now, they probably have more vinegar than they have olive oil. Um, because it's a cultural thing, too, you know? And most of the olive oil, unfortunately, is in Spanish, but we're working on getting it to be that way. So extremely competitive market, something where as crazy an idea as you may have, if it's packaged really well, studied very well the market, produced in, a, in a, an efficient and effective way, so it's cost effective as well, it's a prescription for success in the American market. Now against this backdrop of the interesting aspects of the, of the United States, what interests are there for Spanish companies? Why would Spanish companies now begin to sort of look and sort of tantear un poquito with the, with the mercado americano, which is an interesting, complicated, but nevertheless important market for Spanish products? Well, first of all, whether you believe it or not, the United States is the first commercial partner of Spain outside of the European Union. So there are more Spanish exports to Spain than there are to any other non-European Union country. Spain has also been one of the largest direct uh, foreign investors in the American economy. So much so that it has produced approximately 69,000 jobs in the United States. And a lot of these are not <coughs> olive oil jobs, people. These are ferroviario, uh, aeronautica, um, energia renovables. Um, I mean, we're talking high tech stuff. I remember one time, if you've ever been upstate New York, there's a lovely area called the Finger Lakes. Has anyone ever been? Beautiful place. Very bucolic, these gorgeous lakes, which represent the hand of God. That's why they're called the Finger Lakes, because if you look at it from the sky, it looks like God put his hand there. All the lakes are very elongated. And I remember being in one of these lakes called Candegua, and I looked up, and in the middle of this beautiful area was a windmill. That's a Spanish windmill. Windmill. I'm using a Quixote Cervantine uh, term. What do you call them? Hidrolica, no? Aurolica, no? So, I mean, we're talking, you know, not Spain that is, you know, patas de jabón and chorizo. We're talking about a very high quality, high technical export to the United States. Yes? Sorry about Spain is having many difficulties to trade with the food. Yes, we're working on that. Yeah, with the Food and Drug Administration. There's a lot of controls. We're doing a lot better. We've got minor successes with the black olives that are now being sold for Teddy Pizza, as a matter of fact. Um, olive oil, uh, the Jamon Serrano, obviously. Yeah, There's yeah. also. Yeah, sorry. The Jamon Serrano has, like, the um, United States don't have the same. Uh, like policies with the food that is spent. Exactly, exactly. But that's important because when you transport goods from one country to another, you have to respect whatever that importing country's norms are. So if our norms are this kind of bacteria or that kind of bacteria for jamón serrano, or it can't come with a pata, or it has to be in basado al vacío, then that's, those are the terms of trade that have to be respected, obviously. One of the big problems with Spanish food products is that it were overwhelmed by the Italians. No, the Italians have presunto. You know presunto? It's not as good as Jamón Serrano. <coughs> no, but that's what you see in American um, delis or American stores. You see Italian olive oil. You see Italian wines. Okay? Because the Italians are just really good at selling themselves and marketing, which is where Spain, I believe, is now with the campaigns that are out there for Made in Spain and La Marca España. So I think that we're definitely on the right road to to do competitive battle with the Italians on the American marketplace. Um, there are probably about 650 American companies that are here in Spain. Um, oftentimes nowadays you hear bad things about you know, the ERAs and you know, closing up certain companies, but um, the fact of the matter is, is that the Americans still see the Spanish market as an interesting one. 
with a highly qualified workforce, interesting areas of the world to, to work in, and with easy access, particularly for, for birds. Um, what else is there? Uh, in 2012, as a matter of fact, with the crisis, again, I tend to be a little bit of a Pollyanna and very optimistic, but out of all crises, as long as they may be lasting in Spain, are opportunities. So it forces countries to restructure, it forces countries to look at what are my strong points, to remarket themselves, and in many cases to look for outside markets to sell their products, which they're not selling either in Europe or in Spain itself. So what we see is, for example, in 2012, in Andalusia had more exports than Catalonia. It was the Comunidad Autónoma with more exports than any other comunidad, representing 19.3% of all Spain's exports. Uh, Catalonia was 18.7%. Um, these are data from Extenda. In 2010, which we're still, you know, it's pretty much in the crisis, there were 1,122 Andalusian countries working in the United States. By 2012, 1,616. And again, some of these are olive oil companies, some of these are patas de jamón, but many of these are high-tech companies, particularly, not only the ones we've already mentioned, railroads, because if anyone's traveled in the United States, President Obama has signaled the Spanish railroad system as one that we need to emulate, to have better realities there. Um, Avangoa, obviously, Talven for the renewable energies, um, Aeronautica, and also um, uh, high-tech... Mm, <coughs> But no, um, well that too probably, but biochemistry, like cutting edge genetic stuff, like pharmaceuticals, amazing advances for Andalusian companies, that's what I'm most familiar with, but let's just say Spanish ones in general. So what about the future prospects? So I think that given the long history, and again, the Americans now are doing a lot of celebrating of this 500th anniversary of Ponce de Leon, which I'm sure all of you know about. Um, so I think that it, it, I think it represents an opportunity for the United States to signal out Spain and the, and the importance of Spanish history, um, Spanish influences in our language, in the names of our cities, in the houses that we live in in certain parts of the United States. A long tradition, a 500 year tradition, which has had its ups and downs of course, but one which definitely places Spain as an important partner for uh, both our own economic uh, renewal, as well as that of Spain. Also related to this is the question of immigration. For those of you that follow the news, we are now in a big political debate that how can we normalize the more than 11 million um, persons working in the United States illegally. I just read an interesting article about you really shouldn't say illegal, you really shouldn't say non-documented, so I don't know what to call these people, but they're people who are not living in the United States with either a visa or a green card. And it's an important part of our, our society, our economic society, but also our culture, because the United States is the country of give me your, your poor and your uh, laden and the people that don't have anything. We'll take them. You don't want them, old Europe, we'll take them. And it's that basis of immigration, of you know the sort of the uh, rough rider, the cowboy mentality that has made the United States the type of country that it is, and the type of you know individualism. This um, a country that we don't care if your name is Kennedy. I don't care if your name's Kennedy. You have to prove who you are. Which, as a parenthesis, one of the things that we also do in the United States is our our inheritance laws. Something that just scandalizes me. Spain's how you inherit things in Spain. Um, that doesn't exist in the United States. In the United States, there's no right to anything. My parents passed away, they gave their money away, their things away to whoever they wanted to. There's no tercio, or what do you call that? La legitima, por favor. Yes, we need to get rid of that. Why? Because what happens is it's shown that in really wealthy families, like the Rockefellers, the Hearsts, the Kennedys, you know, too much of something might not be very good. So it's kind of good that cut them off and you go out and make it on your own, little boy. You have the last name Kennedy to help you, and if it helps, great. If it hurts, then it's your problem too. Make it for yourself. So it's another big cultural, con uh, uh, social, um, cultural clash for me because I want my kid to have nothing 
My husband was like, no, we can't. She has to inherit everything. She's an only child. I was like, no, the law has to give me some money to give to somebody other than her. Not that we have that much money, but whatever little there's there. My parents gave me my education. They didn't give me any money. When they died, I didn't get anything. They did what they wanted with their money. It's very interesting, no? Or just the thought that if my husband dies before me, she owns my house. What's that all about? <laughs> no, really. I have to pay. She has to... Oh. Again, this, this very strong feelings we have towards, you know, what I was able to do with my life, thanks to my parents, of course, what they invested in my education, and what values they taught me, but what I was able to do, or not in certain cases, no? So the, the immigration um, ventana is still open. It would be very interesting to see how that's changed. Um, it is difficult, I know, to get visas to go to the United States, but um, more and more, if you're in specialized areas like engineering or any of these high-tech um, professions that we're not producing enough American citizens, that's a lot easier to get your residency after you finish your graduate work. And, and if you decide to stay in the United States, the American government makes it a lot easier for you to do so. And finally, I'll end on this, and then we can open it up and talk about things, and I can talk about job opportunities in the United States as well. Um, is the new term economic diplomacy. And I think more or less we can say that Spain has entered into this phase as well. It's not necessarily our foreign policy. Our foreign policy isn't just Spanish culture, Spanish history, Span Spain's a great place, has great beaches, cheap beer, you know, beautiful women, lovely ferias, yada, yada, yada. But that it is, it has an, an economic base that is very important for the United States, and we can see that in very key industries. Again, I'm not talking about a fake thing come we're talking about high-tech industries where the United States is looking to Spain as a model. And I think that's something that the Spanish should be extremely proud of. I think it also opens up a different opportunity, a different level of relations between the United States and Spain. Something that Mimi Apasiona Muchisima was very important for me to make sure that Spain and the United States, that we get along, it's very important. And that we have a degree of mutual respect, no? With one country a little bit bigger than the other, but nevertheless, both with very important things to, to contribute, both to the global economy as well as to our bilateral economies. So keep an eye on uh, efforts at economic um, diplomacy as well. Yes? But we also have a really big farm, like Santander. We also have the index. We also have so. Great. So, but. <laughs> So it's not jam and things. It's what? It's not only jam and things like that. No, no, no. But that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that the stereotype for Spain, no? And, and that's why I'm saying what the big important part of Spain in the American economy isn't agriculturally based. It's in high-tech industry, whether it's Fara, whether it's, um, you know, uh, Adriolica, Iberdrola, you have Ferroviaria there. I mean, you have a huge presence of Spain in very sophisticated markets. I just want to make sure I understand. I'm not. I'm making the opposite the argument that you're making. It's not. That's a stereotype. You know, it's not just. It's not just ham and aceite o vino. No, 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 no. It's are very high tech areas that you are competing better than your American counterparts. And if the ham and the wine and everything else comes in too, well, we have to say it. But that it's a very sophisticated, it's a different world, it's a very sophisticated world, whereby companies are looking to Spain for leadership in particular areas that are something that we don't have the expertise in. And you can be extremely competitive and innovative. Okay? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah? I'm sorry. The opposite is to be very proud of, of, of where Spain has come and the different industries that you're able to compete effectively in the American market. We want to talk a little bit about work and travel, work and, and ways to go to the United States. How many of you would like to go to the United States to work something, maybe? Okay. Well, for those of you that are undergrads that are doing your licenciatura or what do you call it now, grado, whatever they call it now. Um, before you graduate, usually during the summer, there are many programs in the United States. Usually they have, they have different names, but the CIEE one is Work and Travel. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but it's really easy to get an internship in, in summer in the United States, but to get a visa, you, got, you have to have a sponsor, right? Right, but that's what I want to explain to you, that yeah. there's a program that exists. <laughs> there's a program that exists where we have like a, what do you call it, de Trabajo. So you apply, you go through all the pasos, and you get selected, and maybe your job is going to be 
um, a waiter in a, I'm giving you some examples of some of the Sevianos that we sent last year. We had one guy who gave change in an amusement park. Okay, you know what that is? Like you stand there and they give you a dollar and you give them four quarters so they can play the machines. Okay? Um, waiters, waitresses, and a lot of those service industries that at least now, four or five years ago, the, the scenario was a little bit different. Now that um, Americans don't want those jobs. We all know that there are cycles, you know, depending upon how the local economy is, no? So, for example, in seasonal um, economies, like ski resorts, for our Latin American friends, when it's summer there, it's winter here, so they can come up and they work in the ski resorts. For our Europeans, um, usually it's our summer, so it begins end of May with Memorial Day, and ends the first of September, well, the first week of September, <coughs> Labor Day, our Labor Day. Uh, so when you have freedom during that time, when you're done school, Spanish calendar, fastidio un poquito de tema. But um, if you guys could get done a little bit quicker, it would be a lot easier to get jobs, because you're competing with the French, the Poles, um, the Russians, and you know, a lot of times their English is a little bit better, and they also get out of school a lot earlier. So anytime, that, that's always been a real big problem for us. But anyway, they're happy to receive you at the beginning of July, stay until the beginning of September, you work, you can work as many jobs as you want, you get your visa, you get F1 visas, um, you make a lot of money, and uh, you make a lot of friends, hopefully, and you learn a different culture where you work, 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 work. Um, it's a very international environment as well, so it's also kind of fun to meet people from different countries, not only Americans, obviously, working on your language skills, and then you're allowed um, one extra month there if you want to travel around. That's why it's called work and travel. So it's not just to machacarte, but it's also for you to learn what it's like to have to work hard and not in the most glorious of uh, jobs. You're not advising President Obama on his economic policy. You're making pizzas, you're you know, giving change to people, etc. Um, sweeping up you know, in Sea World after you know, the, the guests that arrive there. I think it's a very interesting program for, for students. If you wanted a long-term um, commitment, then that would be something that's a little bit more formal, that we could, would be interesting to actually start working with these Spanish companies that are setting themselves up in the United States to start getting some, a real serious system of uh, practicas, internships for you. And that's also something that we can do through our Internship USA program. I will provide that information to Borja, and he can pass it along, or you can put it in your newsletters, or however you so desire to advertise it. But it's a very, very interesting program, um, and one which allows you to mature and identify different areas of um, uh, different economic uh, avenues that either you want to work in or you're really not all that interested to work in. So. Any other questions or comments? I talk too much. No, none? So what do you think about U.S.-Spanish relations? Are we on a better track now? I feel very positive, but I'm a Pollyanna. I'm an optimist by, by definition. I think that we've really kind of dealt with the major issues, and I think that the economic bonanza that the American market represents for Spain, particularly now in a, in a period of crisis, could be a, an interesting opportunity for, for Spanish companies, for Spanish young people, for students, etc. So. Yeah, I have a question for you. Okay. Could you explain to our students uh, what do you think about the opportunity to go to Universities like Marquette, San Francisco, or oh, yes. Chicago. I have to do the plug for <laughs> studying abroad. Without to pay the tuition. Without paying the tuition. I mean, so, paying our tuition. Right. So how many kids a year do you get to send abroad? Or sent to the Jesuit universities? Uh, to the United States, yes. this year we're sent to Jesuit University, we're sending six. Four of them, they are right there. Who are you guys going to go? Raise your hand. Okay, so where are you guys going? Yeah, Chicago. Chicago, mm, nice place, Windy San City. Francisco. Where? San Francisco. Oh, San Francisco, por favor. <laughs> really crappy places you send these kids, huh? San Francisco. San Francisco as well? Milwaukee. And Milwaukee, Marquette? Yeah. Oh, Milwaukee is one of North America's best kept secrets. It is just so coqueta. I love that town. It's so nice. Close to Chicago, close to that. Wonderful, wonderful town. They even have a Calatrava bridge there that you'll recognize when you go. The Sevillanos we recognize it because of our, our Puente del. Alright, so, for those of you who aren't going, why aren't, why aren't more people going? Because of the agreements? Uh, I mean, uh, right now what we have is this six position, but uh -huh. it was pretty tough to, to get them. But we are talking to more and more universities. Okay. And especially now you have to understand that we only have uh, undergrad students for business. Great. So, when we have uh, Loyola fully working, we will have more degrees and more mm -hmm. materials. 
but um, uh, how you can explain how difficult it is to, to you know, uh, get admitted in the university. It's, it's very true what Warren is saying. First of all, as a future paying parent, for your parents to pay to go to these universities, American universities on average cost probably what? 50,000 euros a year? On average, and that's not even una buena. That's una normalita. My husband's like, I don't think this is a very good investment. And I'm like, yeah, trust me, trust me. He's a businessman, so he knows it's not a good investment at all. Um, this is an amazing opportunity for those of you who can compete for this in the future. It's not on a competitive basis, I would assume. Um, first of all, you're going to be in an, in, in an ambiance that is very American. The good thing is it's Jesuit. And uh, I went to a Jesuit school as well. My daughter goes to a Jesuit school. I'm a very firm believer in, in the mission of the Jesuits, and it's, it's obra. Um, but I think that will help you, because you'll be with people with similar values. You know what I mean? It's not like you're being clocked at in a huge state university, uh, although these are large universities. They're not you know, 70,000 people. Um, they're in amazing cities. Probably Milwaukee is the smallest of those cities, but I think also very, very interesting. I personally love Milwaukee. Um, San Francisco, of course, is absolutely amazing, and Chicago as well. What you need to do when you go there is, is I don't think there'll be a large international <coughs> student community. Do not live with the international students. That's my first um, recommendation. Remember, uh, in the United States, much of our international student body, particularly in San Francisco, probably will come from China. It's nothing against China, but I, I think that your mission should be to be with the Americans and to have American compañeros, and to learn, be invited to an American Thanksgiving, be invited to an American, how an American, how a, a, a new Jewish friend, how they celebrate their Hanukkah. I mean, that's the cool thing about America, is the diversity. Um, Jesuit schools aren't as diverse as other places, but there is a mission towards diversity and allowing people from different social classes into the university. So I think you should really seek out that essence of, um, you know, the anti-meritocracy, the anti really around first generation university students, for example. And you'll be incredibly motivated. Uh, you'll learn from them. And you know, they'll learn a lot from you, too. The Spanish education system is an excellent educational system. You'll be very well prepared. You will probably know much more than they do in terms of facts and data and geography and history and so on and so forth. Don't be too offended by, you know, some, some Americans. Take it all with a, as a learning opportunity, right? You are ambassadors of Spain. You're ambassadors of Europe. Use it as that sort of an opportunity. And enjoy and uh, make the most of any activities that are related to, again, what we're talking about here, innovation group work, um, working with people who are pitardos. You know, I mean, there's a lot of pitardos out there, too. Um, but, you know, you have to learn how to manage them as well. It's a part of our growing experience. Not everybody is perfect. Thank God, you know? Um, travel as much as you possibly can. It's a little more difficult in the United States because of distances, but try to get to La America Profunda, you know? Try to see differences, coastal differences, north-south differences are very even interesting for me as an American. When I go to uh, to the south and they're still talking about the Civil War and the war, and I'm like, what war? I'm like, what were you talking about? Thinking like World War One, World War Two, and no, they're still thinking about the American Civil War, uh, which they lost. So that some things are better forgotten, of course. But uh, historical memory is a, is a very important one in the United States uh, and very emotional, very emotional pueblo. So I think that you'll have an amazing time. Don't be homesick. Plus, you got all this Skype and all this other crap to communicate with family. A little bit too much. Don't be on Skype all the time either. Stay off of what do you know? People aren't on Facebook anymore. What do you want? Tweeting or whatever the means of communication. Try to cut yourself off of that for a while too, and really try to immerse yourself in the culture. I think it's a very rewarding experience, and I I congratulate you because it's not easy to leave home, is it? No. Your parents are right dying, your mothers are right like, no, we're going to buy anything new. Yeah, but it's also good for them because it helps us learn a lot more. Make that out in Piedra Gallina. Because it's a, it's, a, it's a truly learning experience. You know, the last thing I want is for my kid to leave home. But I know it's best for her. I know what I had to do, and I know that I'm not the same person, for better or for worse. But it makes you, uh, I think, a, a, a better citizen of the world, you know? just to understand someone different, to be in uncomfortable cultural situations, which some of us have experienced, and learn from it. You know, you can get la bata, but as long as you learn from it and ask and, and try to find out exactly why, it's an amazing learning experience for you. Absolutely amazing. So congratulations, and I wish you all the best. Any a lot of fun. For the whole year they're going?
Yeah, we go for two semesters. There are two other girls that they are studying now, one in France and the other one in the UK. <coughs> so they also receive the scholarship. But I mean, but they, they are among the best students because uh, when we send them, they have to have very good academic records, mm -hmm. very good language skills, and mm -hmm. highly motivated and intelligent people. So, but they don't ask very much. So I'm a little bit disappointed. <laughs> That's okay. They're shy. They're shy. Don't be a shy student. Well, thank you very much for your time. It was very interesting to be able to reflect a little bit more seriously on this, um, on this subject, which I, again, very positive about U.S.-Spain relations. I think that we're in a, a new era, um, and the more students that go to the United States, because we have a lot of Americans already studying here in Spain, I think the more we can bridge uh, cultural differences, understandings, you can take in as much as you possibly can that you know will benefit you when you come back to Spain and then come back with your compañeros. When, do they do something when they come back? Do they help other people or say, look, well, five things I learned, it's no. the coolest thing yeah, that we yeah. all need to do? They're the Monday program. Yeah, okay, you good. Know, so we yeah. have an uh, international student association where they are helping to uh, American students. Mm -hmm. Actually, my American students, I guess that now they're in Rome because they're traveling all the way. So They're uh, always traveling. Mm -hmm. That's one of the problems. Yeah, but... Um, so uh, thank you very much, uh, my my pleasure. it has been a real pleasure to, to have you here today. Um, uh, this is um, uh, it's going to be a long, uh, I would say, friendship in terms that Universidad de Loyola in Andalusia is very interesting in the United States. The model that uh, we want to have for our university, it's a doctoral research university following the Carnegie Mellon Foundation, so that means a lot in terms of relationship because we want to have a model, uh, a new Saxon model of university. Uh, besides all the new uh, relationships that we are opening up with uh, American universities, most of them Jesuit, but also non-Jesuit universities, uh, we are organizing a number of activities where not only Afeite and Jamon uh, are the, you know, the important uh, facts. Actually, I have to tell you solely for, uh, for you to know that there are 25 students from Loyola Chicago will have uh, inside program uh, during the month of June. Uh, so uh, it's a very good opportunity also for us to learn more from the United States. Actually, we are also looking for families uh, because we have a number of families that they want to also uh, to, to be the, the, the host for these students. We have around 15 family now because uh, the, the American students, when they go abroad, they, most of them, they rather prefer to go to families rather to go to a residence hall because they want to learn more. Right. So it's in the opposite that it happens to us. Uh, besides of that, we will have for the first year also an uh, inside program in uh, sustainability, sustainable business. So we will guide uh, students from uh, Santa Clara University in California, in Silicon Valley, to all the very good resources that Andalusia has developed in this field. Today we couldn't run the, the video, but uh, uh, in another time I would like to show you how President Obama was talking about the position of Spain ahead of the United States in terms of renewable energy. And actually I wanted to, talk to show you how President Obama, Obama was uh, talking about the city of Cordoba. Because we are, for the Americans we are Cordoba, not Cordoba, Cordoba. So you will see. Uh, so thank you very much uh, again. Um, we will welcome Maria Teresa, I suppose, that many, many times in the future. And uh, thank you for coming to all of you, and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you.